Got that settled. I'm still delighted to be here. Well, less delighted. There we go. Um, all right, so let's uh, get going. And I'll to my collaborators. Couldn't do it without them. Uh, so uh, the problem, which uh, the Summer Institute, I'm sure you've been uh, talking about uh, at some length, or at least the problem I'm going to address, what is consciousness useful for, if anything? I mean, we are trying to explain one of the defining traits of being human. Uh, certainly consciousness gives us a, a rich, uh, subjective experience uh, of our own lives, makes our lives entertaining to us. Uh, but does it do anything else? Does it have any uh, usefulness? Uh, in order to address the problem, uh, we have most many theories of consciousness distinguish uh, two levels. Uh, Ezekiel uh, started off saying uh, uh, there are all these fancy schmancy theories about social and cultural issues and phenomena and so on. He was wanted to focus instead on the most uh, basic level. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the, uh, the more uniquely human level, the more advanced, although uh, the two are clearly linked. Uh, so call them phenomenal awareness, as that's what he says is like to be a, a bat or a mouse or something. Is there an experiencing agent there? Uh, conscious thought uh, has much more uh, in the sense of symbolic uh, connections, reasoning, sense of self as distinct from others, and so on. Roughly, uh, there's the level at which our consciousness is the same as what all other animals have, uh, and the level or kind that is uniquely human. And uh, my particular focus is going to be on the latter. And uh, just as uh, uh, Ezekiel was able to talk about the brain and the mind as a solitary entity and explaining the lower level, uh, I'm thinking to explain the higher level, we are going to have to move beyond one brain and understand uh, social phenomena and, and communication and, and mutual understanding. Now, I think with this kind of argument that consciousness in my field of social psychology would be uh, very popular and highly respected, uh, but no, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, many people are detracting and saying it doesn't do this, doesn't do that, it's really a waste of uh, protoplasm or whatever. Um, and it doesn't do anything other than, as I said, uh, you know, they are still conceited, it gives us a rich, entertaining experience of our own lives, but does it have any usefulness other than that? The critique is not new, of course, the steam whistle hypothesis, which uh, Ezekiel mentioned, uh, Thomas Huxley, 1874, the steam whistle being a little thing up on the side of the locomotive, it tells you something about what's going on inside the engine. It, it derives from it. It may express it, whatever. But it's, it's all effect and no cause. The, the steam whistle doesn't move the train, doesn't steer the train. Uh, it's just a result. Uh, uh, more modern uh, expressions of uh, this sort of skepticism. Tim Wilson, uh, most people would agree, the causal role of conscious thought has been vastly overrated. Uh, just how vastly? Uh, only my friend John Barge has been bold enough to give a precise estimate. Uh, and I, I didn't check his calculations, but 99.44% uh, uh, automatic. Now notice that phrase, though, from moment to moment. Uh, I'm not putting up these uh, sentences to pick on them and say they're wrong. Uh, what I want to do, uh, if, if we go back to the moment or moment, there is a way in which that uh, could be correct, and yet consciousness could have tremendously important functions that are not necessarily from moment to moment. Uh, Barge and Chartrand elaborate, most of a person's everyday life is determined uh, by their conscious intentions and not by their conscious intentions and deliberate choices, but by uh, unconscious automatic processes. All right. And uh, again, um, I'm not putting these up just to, say, just to trash them or say they're wrong. I've worked in different areas in my career, come across many of these controversies that go on decade after decade. Uh, it's usually not that one side is wrong and refuses to admit it, although I suppose that happens. Uh, more often, the endless controversies are either because the question is wrongly phrased or that both sides have valid points and they are uh, talking past each other. So if we want to figure it out, we want to understand what both sides, what's right about both sides, uh, try to integrate them and come up with a, uh, a theory that, uh, that, that melds what's uh, correct about both sides, and that's probably the best we can do uh, at any given point uh, in time. So uh, with that in mind, let's look at a, a few of the major critiques uh, that have been said of uh, the efficacy of consciousness. Um, Nisbet Wilson argued that uh, people introspect and tell you why they did stuff, uh, and they're just making it up or borrowing from um, uh, a stockpile of explanations of what the culture thinks, uh, why people do things. Uh, it's not general uh, introspection. So consciousness doesn't really know what's going on inside the self in many cases. Uh, around the same time, uh, Gizaniga, um, his uh, studies of split brain, uh, said oh, the consciousness tries to explain the world, and you, you give different stimuli to different parts of the brain, it will uh, 
emerge them or offer an explanation of one in terms of the other or whatever. It's clearly just making stuff up. It doesn't really know what's going on. And some people say, well, come on, it's not always wrong. And he says, well, that, that's true, but uh, um, the fact that it's sometimes wrong and doesn't know it is wrong means that it's not all that reliable uh, and therefore can't be all that uh, useful then either. Uh, Libid, I'm sure you've heard about uh, several times during the Summer Institute. Uh, so brain activity uh, commences uh, just before uh, the, um, um, the conscious decision to uh, make the wrist movement or the finger movement. Uh, so the implications of that are hotly debated. Uh, some of us say, well, duh, you know, conscious experience has to be produced by the brain, so of course the brain has to do something before uh, uh, there's a conscious event. Uh, but others say, no, no, that means that uh, the unconscious, the brain is already doing it by the time consciousness comes along. Uh, it's already happening and consciousness is just like a steam whistle, just a read out to let you know it's happening, uh, but it doesn't have any causal effect. Um, uh, and then uh, there's work by Bards, lots of things we thought where consciousness was needed for uh, can be duplicated uh, by uh, uh, unconscious uh, stimuli that uh, uh, you can uh, activate in various uh, things, prime people to see things far away or act like uh, elderly, um, move their faces into certain uh, uh, positions, and that alters their behavior. So, uh, in other words, lots of unconscious processes can produce the actions. Consciousness isn't needed for that. Um, and last, uh, uh, Wegner's uh, stuff on the uh, illusion of conscious will. As I argue that consciousness doesn't necessarily even know when it's doing something or when the self is uh, behaving, falsely takes credit and responsibility for good and bad things, and also falsely denies uh, for stuff that it did. So it doesn't really even know uh, what the self is doing. All right, well, taken together, that's a pretty devastating barrage of the <laughs> against the usefulness of consciousness, um, essentially saying it's flawed and unreliable of perceiving the self uh, and the world around it. Uh, and uh, somewhere between ineffective and certainly dispensable in terms of direct control of action. So that brings up the first of my three questions, the why, what, and how. Why then do we even have consciousness? Now, uh, answers to that are mostly focused on what I call input and output. Uh, consciousness is there to help us see the world around us, um, and, and or consciousness is there to help us uh, guide behavior, to move our, our body. Um, so uh, one or the other of those. Uh, the criticisms, though, suggest that it's uh, not all that removed from those. It's certainly making plenty of mistakes in both. Uh, so um, does that mean that consciousness has no function, or uh, does it mean uh, that maybe we should look uh, elsewhere for the functions of consciousness? And particularly, maybe they apply only to phenomenal awareness. As, as Ezekiel said, uh, uh, you've got movement, uh, conflict to go left or right or whatever. Uh, then you need consciousness uh, to resolve that. But the, uh, the, more, uh, the more human level, the more advanced level, uh, input and output don't seem to be uh, the, the possible functions. So either it has no functions or we should look elsewhere. If elsewhere, where? What else uh, uh, would it be? Um, several steps removed, perhaps, from input and output. Consciousness is some kind of internal processing. That's at least plausible. Uh, and we could reconcile with all those critiques and say those critiques are valid or mostly valid. Consciousness isn't good at this or that. Uh, but uh, maybe it's internal processing of things, you know, not bringing stuff in new, not putting new, not putting new behavior out. Uh, but internal processing that could be helpful in some way. Uh, put for short, consciousness, maybe the brain making input into itself. Now, uh, to understand why it would do that, uh, let's uh, go back to the steam whistle for a moment. Uh, the steam whistle idea is the unconscious runs everything. Unconscious creates conscious thoughts. The unconscious creates behavior. There are no arrows leaving conscious thoughts, so again, it is effect and not cause. That's the steam whistle idea. Uh, but uh, maybe all I have to do is add one uh, little arrow. Okay, maybe flash, I think. Uh, and uh, suddenly, conscious uh, thoughts could have utility again. They're still not directly guiding behavior, as uh, the critics have suggested. Um, but uh, what happens in consciousness could feed back into the unconscious processes and alter them, uh, and thus indirectly alter behavior. Uh, and another, perhaps, uh, way of looking at it, another thing to consider, uh, perhaps conscious thoughts are some way helpful for interacting with the social and the cultural environment, uh, communicating, understanding others, and so on. And those, too, uh, ultimately can influence behavior by way 
inter, inter, indirectly of influencing unconscious processes. So uh, again, ready to uh, suggest that you know, the, the link from unconscious behavior, as, as Barge perhaps said, uh, from moment to moment, the effects of, unco of, of uh, the guidance of behavior, 99 uh, plus percent uh, unconscious, uh, but conscious could have an indirect and yet profoundly important uh, influence. Now, uh, so going back to the brain making input to itself, what is the purpose of the human brain? Why, why do we have it? Uh, why uh, is there more and more? I think it's not for solving problems in the physical world, but for tapping into the social group, for uh, accessing the information that the group has, for figuring out the systems by which the social group does things, and by uh, fitting oneself into those. Uh, that that's uh, our, our, our culture is our biological strategy. It's how we survive and reproduce. Um, and uh, been very successful at that, so you need some kind of advanced hardware to make that work. I spend a lot of thing, con time pondering things like uh, uh, arithmetic. Uh, is arithmetic nat nature or culture? Uh, every culture, when they multiply, they get the same answer. Uh, so it seems like it's objective. It's certainly not culturally relative. And yet we certainly learn it from our culture. Uh, so it seemed like a peculiar little exception, but after a while I realized it's not an exception. Almost all the knowledge we have is stuff that can be only gotten at uh, by a group, that if you started from scratch, you could never develop mathematics in one lifetime. It has to be built up over many generations. Uh, and much of the other knowledge we have, including presumably everything you hear in the Summer Institute, uh, is the result of many people working on topics, interacting, sharing ideas, and, and building uh, up information over many generations. And if uh, arithmetic doesn't impress you, uh, think of uh, farming and uh, cooking and agriculture uh, and stuff like that. Uh, these are all things uh, highly important for culture and, and for survival. I have a, uh, a headline from The Onion uh, reflecting uh, uh, why you couldn't develop cooking by yourself in uh, one generation <laughs> as a solitary effort. There's a lot of trial and error, uh, and a letter rather painful trial and error. Uh, so, uh, cooking, tremendously important for the success of our species, but uh, again, even if you developed one recipe in your lifetime, you'd stop there. You wouldn't keep experimenting uh, because of that. Uh, so, uh, again, culture in the sense of sharing information, accumulating knowledge across generations, crucial to the success of our species, uh, and more and more, I think, uh, the defining traits that make us human uh, the, uh, the, the psychological traits that uh, distinguish humans from others are essentially adaptations to enable us to make this new kind of social life work, to make uh, culture successful, to participate in it, uh, and benefit from it. Now, um, going back to uh, how the brain fits in, uh, when evolutionary theory was first applied to the brain, people figured out pretty fast that uh, being smart was the key to being human, uh, hence we named ourselves uh, Homo sapiens, which is Latin for smart dudes. Um, and uh, uh, so the big brain was the key, and they explained, well, humans uh, were figuring out stuff in the world, and we evolved this bigger and bigger brain because it's always better to be smarter. Uh, and then uh, once we had this big brain, we evolved the upright posture so we wouldn't be bonking our, our, fa our fancy brain into the trees and the, on the ground. And once we were standing upright, then we, our hands were free, and we could start to uh, make tools and do stuff. And it was a great story. Um, it was, however, uh, demolished in the 1970s when they found Australopithecus, who walked upright already, but had a tiny little pea brain. So it looked like somehow we started being human-like, walking upright before the brain. So that raised some questions. Why? What was the impetus to uh, produce the upright posture and start us on our human evolution? And then what did finally get the, uh, the brain going? Why, why did we become smart uh, if we could already walk uh, upright? What, what, what changed with being upright that uh, uh, made intelligence more advantageous? Well. Um, one answer to that uh, goes back to the, the mirror neurons, and as I'm sure you've uh, heard and talked about, uh, these are brain cells that uh, fire when the self does something, they also fire when someone else does something. So they recognize uh, actions in others. And as the original paper said about mirror neurons, there are a couple interesting facts. One is they're especially attuned to the uh, arms and hands, uh, and second, they will complete uh, an action even if it's not completed live. So a monkey sees another monkey reach for a banana, he doesn't get it, but the monkey watching it says, well, he was going for that banana. He doesn't say that, but you know, he, he somehow understands, which is useful, because then, well, if I have a longer arm, I could go get that banana. Um, so uh, anyway, um, this is, this, uh, these brain cells attuned to the arms and hands of others and completing the action. As they said, this is the beginnings of theory of mind, as you're inferring the intention, the goal, 
I mean, just on a very simple motor action of another creature based on watching it. Well, the monkeys didn't necessarily do all that much with it, but somehow, uh, in our ancestors, they started to realize that, well, if you're inferring my mental state from watching my hands, I can use my hands to signal uh, to you uh, and, uh, and, and get, get information passed along and influence you and, and so on and so forth. Um, and fairly strong case that uh, in terms of uh, evolution of communication, gesture came first. It started with using the hands for it. Uh, speech came along a lot later. Um, as just one sign of it, uh, many studies show that you can, we can teach other animals to communicate with sign language, uh, but none of them can be taught to speak. They don't have enough control over their, uh, the voice, the, uh, the movement of the voice box and everything else that went with it to make speech possible. Uh, that was risky and that happened later in evolution when communication presumably was already happening uh, because it was important uh, and, and, and advantageous. So it looks like we started uh, by communicating with signals and just making sounds because you can't communicate with signals if people don't pay attention like uh, 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 uh. Uh, So uh, uh, it started like that and then over time they reversed in importance and now we use our hands uh, to elaborate or to, to, to gesture or to embellish a bit while well, the real communication is done uh, with voice. So uh, the point is uh, that may have been the, 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 the defining uh, or original human trait. Uh, human evolution started with communication and the social sharing of information, uh, more basic than intelligence, uh, as the essential trait uh, of humankind. Um, and so uh, at some point uh, in, in Pleistocene or whatever, we, our ancestors moved out of the jungles into the grasslands. Uh, there our competition was the big cats, uh, lions and tigers and whatnot. Uh, now one thing we could have done is evolved more cat-like traits and become more like them to compete. But instead of that, that's where we went our own way and sort of evolved this social cognitive niche where we worked together, shared information, cooperated, uh, had interlocking roles, things like that. Uh, and that's uh, what ultimately made us the most fearsome hunters uh, rather than the, the cats and, and, and others. So I was at some point uh, around uh, there uh, that uh, uh, we started developing uh, our culture and our, our way of, uh, of living. Uh, and so this all sheds light on those questions. As I said, why the upright uh, posture? Uh, I think a, a big part of the answer is, is that it was, uh, the hands were for gesture. It wasn't tool use, that came much later. Uh, but uh, uh, especially when we weren't being in the uh, living in trees anymore and didn't need our arms as much to hang onto the branches, uh, being upright to uh, use our arms for communication, uh, that's, uh, uh, that was crucial and that was a big advantage. And that then would create the, the selection environment to increase intelligence. You say, why did the brain start expanding? Well, nature doesn't present enough fascinating problems uh, for the solitary mind to solve. Uh, as I said, you wouldn't get very far doing arithmetic even if you had the idea to try to develop it on your own. Uh, but once the group is sharing information socially, then the smarter brain would have advantage and uh, groups, uh, you know, family groups and so on with the bigger brains uh, could communicate more, uh, manipulate the information, understand each other better, and they'd have an advantage uh, over uh, rival uh, families that uh, uh, maybe didn't uh, process the information effectively. Um, so, uh, getting back then, what does this tell us about the purpose of conscious thought? I, truism in psychology goes back to William James. My thinking is always for my doing. It's been repeated uh, by various other thinkers ever since then. Uh, Susan Fisk, uh, thinking is for doing in 1993. Uh, 1993. Um, we have to pick on Susan Fisk here. Uh, she, not only is she one of our leading scholars, but you know, she, as they say, she wrote the book on social cognition. Uh, influential book uh, covering that work. And so when she says thinking is for doing, we should listen. Still though, uh, I have to uh, uh, point out that uh, to write that book, she must have read hundreds of experiments on social cognition, and there's hardly any doing in any of those experiments. I mean, there's a certain irony in concluding that thinking is for doing based on a research literature that studies thinking with no doing anywhere in sight. Um, the people mostly responding, you know, ch responding uh, to computer stimuli and stuff like that. Uh, there's very little action. So um, at least it seems uh, we want to consider an alternative to the hypothesis that thinking is for doing. And uh, for that, you can go back to principle, it's been one of the guiding themes of my careers. Inner processes serve interpersonal functions. What goes on inside uh, the human mind is there to help us relate to each other. 
Um, and so let me just, uh, I mean, in a trivial sense, uh, thinking has to be for doing at some point, but uh, uh, if we want to consider an alternative hypothesis that's at least viable, maybe conscious thinking is for communicating. Thinking is for talking is a, is a shorthand. Uh, and it's just as some reasons to argue that this is plausible, that we, we need uh, uh, consciousness for talking. First of all, you have to be conscious of what you're saying when you're talking. You, you can't really be thinking about something else while you're talking about one thing. Uh, I can't be having a, you know, wild uh, daydreams uh, while I'm uh, giving a lecture here and, and so forth. Uh, so wh what you say has to be conscious. The converse is not true. It is possible to be conscious of thoughts and not blurt them out. Admittedly, I know people who seem not to have discovered this principle. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, even so, the silent thoughts that people have in their mind, uh, much of that is imaginary talking. People imagine conversations. Uh, if you take that away, there's not a lot of uh, thought that, that, that often uh, goes on. Often people are rehearsing specific conversations, uh, or even just though thinking their thoughts, they're imagining uh, saying something uh, to someone else. Uh, there's a psych bulletin article on uh, uh, looking at the, all the studies where people talk uh, talk, talk their thoughts, in other words, think aloud while they solve problems. If talking and thinking were two separate things, then thinking to solve the problem and talking would be two separate tasks, and so all the, the, the resources you put into talking would make you do worse uh, at the thinking. And yet, even with meta-analysis, which you know, combines many results and gives you a, a microscope to detect fine differences, no significant difference uh, in quality of performance uh, as a result of uh, uh, talking aloud. It, doesn't, it slows you down a little bit because you can't talk quite as fast as you can think. Uh, but in terms of quality performance, uh, no, uh, no effect whatsoever. So that suggests that the inner processes that produce talking and the inner processes that produce thinking are essentially the same process up until almost at the end where uh, perhaps you, uh, you, you inhibit saying it and you, you learn to do that. Um, a couple things go with that. Uh, certainly when kids learn to read, uh, that's how they, uh, they do it. They first learn to read aloud everywhere in the world, and then later they learn to, uh, uh, to read without saying it aloud. Uh, but even in adults, there are incipient muscle movements in the larynx and so on when they're reading silently. Uh, this also goes with the uh, influential BBS paper uh, by uh, Mercer and Sperger looking at reasoning. Uh, you know, they look at all the flaws that cognitive psychologists have discovered in reasoning and saying, okay, people are, are, are kind of stupid. Uh, but, well, there are flaws if you think, if you assume the purpose of reasoning is to discover the truth. But if you assume that the purpose uh, of reasoning is to argue with somebody else, uh, then they're not flaws. So, you know, people find confirming, confirming evidence more than disconfirming evidence. Well, if you're a scientist, you've got to look at both, right? The, the, they're equally important. But if you're trying to argue your side, you want confirming evidence. You don't want arguments that help the other side. Uh, so uh, the, the, all those biases uh, are consistent there. Again, consistent with the idea that thinking uh, is basically for talking, uh, and the private thinking in your own mind is a secondary derivative uh, sort of process. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, our colleagues in cognitive psychology, uh, how do they decide if something is conscious? Uh, if it's if the person can say it. If the person can report on an inner state or process or thought, that means it's conscious, uh, if not otherwise. So for them, that's a handy uh, methodological uh, tool, uh, but that seems to be about as far as they reflect on that phenomenon. It's, it's useful, uh, it's nice that nature gave us something to make people good uh, subjects in our experiments. But they never seem to take the other step that maybe that's exactly the point. Uh, being able to report on your thoughts is a crucial uh, key to uh, uh, what they're all about. And, and uh, the, the, the being able to tell your thoughts to another is hugely advantageous, uh, way beyond being a good subject in the experiment. Uh, that maybe that's what being human is all about. Well, let me put this one more way. Sooner or later, most theories about consciousness bump up against this problem. Given that thoughts in the mind can cause behavior, remember, thinking is for doing is the assumption, we know unconscious thoughts can cause behavior, so why do those thoughts need to be conscious? What addition is gained by making those thoughts conscious? And it's very hard to make an evolutionary case. I mean, I say, uh, okay, if I think, don't put my hand in the fire, and then that makes me not put my hand in a fire. Okay, I can see that has some benefit. Good, thoughts cause behavior. But why couldn't those just be unconscious? I mean, just like a robot saying, don't put Andy in the fire. Uh, and uh, that could work well. And then I don't put my hand in the fire, and that's benefit. And so it's, it's hard to think what, what is gained by making them conscious. Uh, but if I can tell my children, don't put your hands in the fire, and they don't put their hands in the fire because of that, I've improved my, repo my uh, reproductive fitness. 
So uh, again, consciousness is a, a facilitating communicating. Uh, that uh, solves some of the problems that have uh, really stumped the, the more intrapsychically uh, oriented theories. All right, that brings us to the second question. Uh, what does consciousness do? Um, now we have to go back uh, earlier instead of why are, what's the purpose of the human brain? What's the purpose of the brain at all? Um, now, uh, essentially, uh, the brain is uh, the, the central of the center of the central nervous system. Uh, information is brought in, aggregated from the different senses and the different uh, lo lo locations, uh, and uh, directed toward uh, uh, toward action. I mean, uh, plants don't need central nervous systems since they don't act, they don't do anything, so they don't have to decide uh, to go there. But an animal, all four of its feet have to walk in the same direction if you're going to get there. Uh, so essentially, the brain is where the stimulus uh, meets the response. Uh, some information comes in, uh, and you, uh, you act immediately. So with a simple, uh, if you have a very simple life, say you're a creature and everything you see, all you have to decide is uh, you're going to eat it, you're going to have sex with it, you're going to run away from it, or ignore it. Um, OK, well then. Uh, uh, it's probably not too hard to match up the stimuli with the information that tells you how to eat it or how to run away from it or how to have sex with it. Uh, it's not that complicated. However, um, the more complicated your life is, the more complicated the problem is of getting the incoming information to the right part of the brain. Uh, or the brain just sort of added, added stuff on. It, it doesn't have a, a central processing unit. Uh, so uh, information that may be useful for how to uh, respond to the situation uh, could be scattered to all different uh, sites uh, all over the brain and the mind. Uh, so how do we get uh, each bit of information that comes in to all the relevant sites that might have relevant information uh, to help you respond properly? And uh, as you see, this is already uh, in a complex physical environment. There can uh, be complications here. Uh, once the social environment uh, uh, is, is complicated, I mean, think of planning a a dinner party or a bank robbery or a summer seminar or whatever, uh, there are a lot of contingencies, a lot of things going in, and you have to give that information to all the parts that's relevant. You can't say, oh, well, you know, this was illegal. We somehow didn't consider that. Um, uh, that's a costly sort of error. So anyway, the response, uh, the, the, the solution uh, to the design problem is apparently to broadcast a signal uh, to uh, the whole brain. and. Uh, uh, Ezekiel's uh, theory uh, built a lot on this, uh, explaining the crosstalk, uh, that uh, information may be in different places. Uh, consciousness is a sort of a fashion, a broadcast signal that goes out uh, to the whole brain and mind, and therefore all the different sites that have relevant information uh, can sort of raise their hand and say, I know what to do about that. I have useful information. Uh, you better consider this. Don't do this. I promised this. Or there's an obligation here. Or there are laws. There are moral issues. Or, uh, or we can do it better this way. Or, and, and so on. I have a coupon. Um, so uh, 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 the, the social brain uh, is just an extreme case in a highly complicated cultural environment. Lots of information, lots of stimuli, lots of information scattered all over. So you need a pretty good, strong signal to go out to the whole big brain. Uh, and uh, elicit all the information. And it's kind of the, the stuff you do. I mean, you, th you think about packing to go on a trip. You hold in your mind where you're going to be, and you think, well, I'm going to this place. I'll need an umbrella. I'm going to give a talk, so I better wear pants. So I'm going out, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you consciously focus on what you're going to do, and then the unconscious produces these associations, and you go and uh, get those and put those things in your suitcase. A lot of behaviors like that, unconscious and conscious, uh, working together. Um, the, 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 uh, the blackboard, I think, was the original uh, metaphor for explaining this. Uh, I'm going to suggest we need a more, more dynamic one. But uh, the basic idea of, of broadcasting to the whole brain, that's uh, still valid uh, and important. All right, uh, so that then brings us back to the, the limit question. Does consciousness cause behavior? And if so, how? Um, well, uh, the. Uh, to, to respond to Libet, I mean, we looked at that situation and uh, you know, making an arbitrary distinction and even told people not to plan, which is one of the few things that, that the mind could consciously do in that uh, situation. Uh, it's sort of a highly artificial situation where there's very little use for uh, the sorts of things consciousness is capable of. Um, so what my colleagues and I did is say, well, let's look for effects of consciousness causing behavior. Uh, the logic of experiment design 
I mean, social uh, psychology experiment has certainly has limitations and questions about it, but it's a good way to establish causality. Uh, if the independent variable is manipulated with uh, random assignment uh, and so on, and then you measure an uh, objective <coughs> behavior, then the independent behavior can be said, the independent variable can be said to cause that behavior. So we look for cases in which the independent variable, uh, again, manipulated, uh, not measured, a manipulated variable uh, referred to some conscious state or conscious event uh, and look for clear uh, behavior results and look for uh, any studies that uh, satisfy those criteria. Those would be evidence of uh, consciousness causing behavior. And uh, we found about 10 different categories. These are in the last year in the annual review if people want a more detailed list. Uh, I'll just give a couple examples here. Mentally simulating thinking makes you more likely to do it. So uh, you imagine yourself voting or you imagine yourself studying, you imagine yourself uh, buying a car or something like that. That makes you more likely to do it uh, down the road. Consciousness has some effect there. Uh, mental practice uh, has actually been uh, documented. It's just about every sport uh, you can imagine. Uh, the, it, it's no substitute for physical practice, but it helps beyond that. So, uh, and there are even studies where, like with the golf putts, and they had some people imagine making it, some people imagine missing it, and the ones who imagine making it were later better at making it. The ones who imagine missing it were worse than the control group. They, they actually screwed themselves up by practicing it wrong, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, anyway, those things uh, clearly work to alter performance. Uh, the plans and intentions uh, clearly make a difference. Uh, uh, Galvitzer's work on implementation intentions, uh, uh, when people, f you know, people have a general idea that I'm going to write this paper or I'm going to uh, uh, take this test or I'm going to uh, start flossing or whatever. I mean, a general value that this is a good thing to do, this slightly increases the likelihood they would do it. If they make a very specific plan that on Tuesday morning I will start working on my paper or uh, uh, on uh, well, Thursday night, uh, after I brush my teeth, I will floss. You know, we make very specific plans like that. That really increases the likelihood of doing it. Uh, so consciousness is helpful. Uh, we think that indication of how conscious and unconscious work together, uh, the conscious helps translate the general goal or value or plan into highly specific instructions that the unconscious can then uh, act on and carry out. Um, so that's thinking about the future, plans and intentions and so forth. Think about the past. People rehearse things, people ruminate, people interpret or reinterpret things happen in the past. These have been shown to, to affect and alter behavior in a variety of ways. Logical reasoning. Um, published a number of studies uh, from my own lab uh, showing that uh, when people are thinking about something else, their logical reasoning performance drops to chance. Uh, but if you engage their conscious uh, uh, efforts by telling them you're going to have to explain your uh, answers and so on, uh, they do actually significantly better than the neutral control. Meanwhile, engaging or hampering the unconscious, uh, like with unconscious load uh, or with uh, unconscious priming the idea of uh, logic, has no effect on actual performance. Um, so uh, as a number of uh, authors have said, and our data very strongly indicate logical reasoning is something that requires uh, consciousness for. Uh, there's some maladaptive effects. Uh, let me just uh, spend a lot of time here, a ton of time here. Uh, perspective taking, uh, uh, highly important. A number of these actually go with negotiation. And negotiation is interesting because, uh, as we know, negotiation is not really found that much in nature. Uh, you know, the big animal wants to eat the little animal, and the little animal says, well, let's make a deal. Uh, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, there's, 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 there's not much of that. But uh, negotiation, humans do that, and it's highly important to the success of culture. You know, economic trade is essentially finding a deal that benefits both parties, so both will do that. Uh, but uh, you need to uh, empathize to understand the other's point of view so that you can see that they need to get something out of it, but they don't get so much that they, they, uh, they rob you or uh, take advantage of you. Uh, and so lots of studies showing you know, conscious understanding the other perspective taking so on improve. Um, Negotiation. Anyway, there's, there's a variety of other stuff. Oh, let me, last one, let me mention communication. Lots of studies show that people get better results when they can communicate, because again, uh, communication uh, requires uh, consciousness. Um, all right, so some general patterns uh, from how consciousness causes behavior. There are lots of uh, these, uh, and uh, empirically, uh, there's no question, plenty of experiments establish that conscious events cause behavior. Mostly, these are highly useful and adaptive. There were fewer maladaptive. Uh, again, con holding thoughts in consciousness will trigger unconscious associations, like the example of packing. Uh, often, 
transforming general specific, uh, uh, general abstract ideas into specific. And you have a general value, broad instruction or whatever, you instantiate it on exactly how to do it, <laughs> like with the implementation intentions, uh, lots of things like that. Uh, effects are mostly indirect, uh, consistent with what Barb said, that uh, from moment to moment, uh, your behavior is 99 plus percent automatic. We didn't find anything to argue with that. Um, that uh, may still be true. Um, uh, but also, uh, uh, simulating events away from the here and now, the unconscious response to the present, as, as most animals do, but we can think about the future, think about the past again. Also, no direct control of muscle movements. I mean, to me, it seems obvious that eventually consciousness has to hand off to, you're not conscious of the, the nerve cells that fire to uh, tell your muscles to move. Uh, so consciousness cannot directly control behavior. Uh, and indeed, some of the maladaptive ones, like why people choke under pressure, uh, is the attempt by consciousness to control a highly skilled automatic habitual behavior, uh, and that's what messes people up. Um, found no proof that uh, choice per se is conscious or agency are conscious. Uh, it's informed by consciousness, it's useful, uh, but the actual decision you know, could be made unconsciously and then announced in consciousness. Also, uh, I mean, one, some of the misinterpretations stemming from Libet uh, go with the idea that, well, there couldn't be any prior cause, that it has to originate in consciousness. We don't have any, any, way, any evidence to argue that uh, behaviors originate in conscious. Uh, conscious things are produced by the unconscious. But still, consciousness is a vital a step in the causal chain, and what happens in consciousness can change uh, the behavior that results. Uh, so, as I said, uh, uh, evidence that conscious thoughts will influence unconscious thoughts and influence behavior there. Again, no, no sign and what we can do, no proof of a direct link from conscious thoughts to behavior bypassing the unconscious. Uh, and uh, uh, a little bit more, consciousness is very useful for integrating across time. So reacting in the present, uh, the unconscious can probably do that pretty well, but lots of things reflecting on the past guides what you do in the present, thinking about the future guides in the present, reflecting on the pl past and making plans will change your behavior in the future. Uh, conscious, again, this is something that humans do much better than other species. We have uh, behavior patterns that are consistent and coherent across time. Uh, we'll have activities that we'll go away from and we'll resume uh, based on goals years in the future. Uh, we revise them and come up with different plans along the way. Uh, highly useful for being successful in culture, uh, but apparently dependent on uh, consciousness. Uh, again, facilitating social influence on behavior, I mentioned that, uh, interacting with others, negotiation, communication, uh, teaching too. The, the teaching one, also relevant, uh, as we know, most other species don't intentionally teach. They have very avid learners, uh, but essentially no sign of deliberate teaching. But teaching requires that you have in your mind an understanding that there's a, another mind that's different, that doesn't know what I know, and I'm trying to put that knowledge into that other mind. Also, conditions where there are multiple possible alternatives. I mean, the very idea of, of negotiation is predicated on there are different possible uh, outcomes uh, to this uh, discussion we're having. Uh, and so how can we find one that is useful uh, for all of us, uh, making decisions, uh, other things as well. And again, works together with unconscious processes. All right, that brings up uh, the last uh, question, uh, final uh, seven minutes, uh, which is how uh, does consciousness work? Uh, what uh, what are the processes by which it gets these things done? Um, so one uh, conclusion in our, our psych review article, um, you put it, consciousness is like a place where the unconscious mind constructs meaningful sequences of thought. Uh, so uh, lots of the thing, uh, the kinds of thoughts that seem to be to require consciousness, because again, the conscious, the unconscious is. Does a lot of thoughts, very powerful, very capable, uh, very efficient, does a lot of things better. Uh, some people say, oh, consciousness is a slow, cumbersome way of doing things, but it can produce maybe some bigger and better thoughts that can't be had in the unconscious. I spent a lot of time thinking of thing, about things like language because uh, we know the unconscious has language. You can subliminally flash a word, and people aren't conscious of seeing the word, but it will change their behavior. So somehow there's language there in the unconscious uh, and yet, uh, like I said, talking requires consciousness. Well, the difference appears to be between words and sentences. And uh, uh, Bernie Byers, who was supposed to speak this morning, I guess will speak this afternoon, uh, he pointed out in uh, one of his papers, uh, uh, with the priming studies, uh, indeed, they're all one word. Uh, nobody primes a sentence. And uh, there are various other kinds of sign. The unconscious can process single words, but not sentences. I contacted Tony Greenwald, who's kept track of this uh, 
uh, the priming literature for uh, a couple decades, he says there's not a single study that passed what he calls the two-word test, uh, that the inter integrated meaning of two words can be primed together. Uh, so the unconscious is kind of like a dog, uh, one word at a time, <laughs> uh, combining uh, with a better vocabulary, admittedly. Uh, the unconscious, not the dog. Um, but uh, well, you start combining words in, in different ways, and the dog you know, gives you that tilt brain uh, look like it doesn't really get what you're meaning. Um, so uh, anyway, combining words into sentences um, is what apparently consciousness is needed for, particularly for understanding uh, the sentences by others. And remember, the purpose of the human brain is so we can relate to the group, started with sharing information. There's a lot more information you can share in sentences than you can share in words. As an information using species, sentences are way better. So consciousness uh, seems to be vital uh, for uh, processing larger chunks of information than can be encapsulated in single words. Logical reasoning, I already mentioned. That's you know, step by step. You're given a premise, and you uh, reason by uh, certain methods to a conclusion. And other people can say, yes, that's the right method. This conclusion is justified. That conclusion is not based on this premise. Uh, so uh, consciousness, again, an important sequence of thought uh, underpins a lot of what we do uh, in, uh, in human social life. Uh, again, depends on, uh, on consciousness. Uh, counting, quantification, a little more complicated argument. I said a little bit about this earlier. Uh, uh, that, uh, um, using numbers and understanding them, it's a bit like the logical reasoning. Uh, you need to be conscious uh, to do that effectively. Um, and uh, causal understandings. Uh, simple causal understandings are found in some other creatures. They can uh, sort of associate things and that the one is preceded by the other uh, and so on. But the understanding of the world is caused by invisible forces and gravity and magnetism and intention and stuff like that. Uh, these seem to be uh, more uniquely human and to depend on our conscious understanding. So again, uh, these are things, like I said, with uh, mathematics, uh, these are objectively true, uh, but mostly are learned from the social environment. So we get them. Uh, from our social group, underscoring the principle that some kinds of knowledge can only be accessed by social groups, that you're not smart enough, the, the single brain by itself isn't smart enough to figure out a lot of that stuff uh, in the short span of a human life. Uh, most of the knowledge we have is built up uh, over many generations, uh, shared and learned collectively. Uh, and so uh, adding, I just want to add two more things on to the end of that. One is stories and narratives. Lots of information about the world uh, is held and possessed in stories and narratives. Uh, and the stories have to have all these traits. Uh, stories are told in sentences. Uh, the stories have to be logical, although they say your story doesn't make any sense. If there are number quantitative uh, aspects to the story, they have to add up. Uh, and stories are typically quite causal about this leads to this leads to that. Uh, so stories, uh, again, important form of medium of human communication depend on, uh, on all these features. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, goes the idea that, that consciousness is for uh, constructing these simulations, for constructing not, not like blackboard static images, but sequences uh, of ideas. So consciousness, conscious experience is, is like little movies that the uh, brain makes for itself about the world around it, uh, about past and the future and so on. Now. Uh, the pretty good evidence that our direct conscious experience of the here and now is, is no such thing. It's highly processed and edited. Uh, Ezekiel was saying some stuff like that too. That uh, you know, when the information—it's not that the information comes to your eye and is transmitted as a picture straight to your brain, uh, where it's uh, the picture is faithfully reproduced. There, rather, it's split apart into all different things, and where it is is processed in one place. What it is is processed in another place. Shape and color and all those other things are processed separately and then recombined, which is how mistakes get in there and illusions are made and so on. So by the time it gets into your conscious experience, it's been highly interpreted and edited uh, and analyzed. Um, so your awareness of the present is itself a simulation. But perhaps it's easier to see instead of uh, looking at uh, um, uh, the uh, here and now, I think a lot of conscious experience is based on the past and the future. And so there, you're clearly not dealing with incoming sensory information, but you're, con you're constructing a fairly vivid, either a memory of something in the past uh, or something in the future. Uh, you know, depending on uh, uh, different surveys, individual differences, a lot of uh, uh, human conscious uh, cognition uh, is devoted things uh, away from the here and now, here uh, graphically depicted. Um, what kind of uh, simulation happens with consciousness? Uh, if you think of consciousness as a little movie that the brain makes for itself, there are two ways of making a movie. Uh, there's a camera, uh, and then there's a uh, animation. Uh, and there's a, the hardware has different functions in those. And 
uh, although we think of them when the senses are like the camera, but really the animation, I think, is a better example. Uh, with the camera, each frame on the film is what the camera saw at that moment. So the hardware is there to take what you're seeing and uh, uh, reproduce that uh, uh, within the mind. Animation, each frame starts with the picture of the free previous frame and then makes a slight adjustment to it. Um, and that's probably, I think, more what consciousness is like. It, it puts something into your mind and then it just updates it there. It doesn't see it. So uh, you know, when I talk to Ezekiel, you know, my mind says, okay, that's Ezekiel. And each time that I continue, to talk, each time I see him, I don't have to say, okay, it's Ezekiel, it's Ezekiel, it's Ezekiel. Uh, that would be a big waste of mental space. Rather, it puts into my mind as soon as I see him, okay, that's Ezekiel. And then we talk. And then after halfway through, I realize, wait a minute, this is not Ezekiel. And I can change it and you know, get somebody else. But uh, again, it's, uh, each moment is built out of the previous moment. So much of the hardware in the brain uh, is to build these uh, uh, series. And again, uh, you can see that much more easily with replaying the past or uh, imagining future events uh, than in the present, because there uh, the sequence, each, each one is built out of the previous one rather than each moment in the, the sequence being generated from scratch. All right, uh, last thing I want to say then, uh, oh, that's why it's zero rather than parallel. Uh, last thing, uh, last couple of minutes is uh, why is this useful socially? Um, if the, the mind is for simulating these sequences, uh, Understanding others, tremendously important. Again, that's what we're about as a species. That's what we do. We cooperate, we interact, and so on. So understanding the mental states, intentions, goals, activities of others, that's a lot there. A lot of human activity simulating what others are, are thinking and feeling, and so on. We learn from past events, uh, not just from present events. Remember, a Skinnerian animal learns in the moment something happens. It's rewarded or punished. It learns then, or it doesn't learn at all. But humans, we can replay things that happened last week or even last year. Uh, we can replay them over and over again. We can replay them counterfactually as if, well, if I had done something else, this would have been. So out of one experience, you can make 50 different uh, learning trials, uh, including the whole range of contingencies, uh, which uh, you can't do without this uh, simulating ability. Decision making is instead of the past, the future. Uh, you can contemplate. Uh, you know, again, go to the Skinnerian rat, comes to the, the end of the maze. Am I going to go left or right? It just kind of has a good feeling that uh, uh, last time I uh, went to the left, and that produced a good result. So it kind of had a good feeling about turning left. It doesn't say, well, the experimenter had the cheese over in the left last time. I'll bet he's going to try to trip me up and put it over in the right. If I go to the right, I could f f fake him out. No, it doesn't uh, have all those processes. But we do. We can think that, that if I do this, they'll say that, and I'll do this, and then they'll do that, and then I'll say this. And then they'll do that, and then I'm screwed. So what I should do is at the second step, I should go the other way and, and, and do that. And that way, you know, presumably that works. Um, and I won't go through all these. Oh, well, the last thing about the self goes back to the, the crosstalk idea. If the stimulus comes in and you act impulsively, like well, you say, though, that doesn't mean that's just one part of the mind or brain responding immediately. But if you think about what you're doing, that gives a chance for all aspects of the uh, brain and mind to contribute their associations. And so in that sense, the uh, action does reflect on the uh, entire self. So, summarize and conclude, uh, the how of consciousness uh, has constructed these uh, meaningful sequences of thought, uh, simulations, it's not a pipeline to reality, but it's a, an educated guess of about what is probably uh, happening or pro probably happened. Oops, uh, uh, in terms of the what, uh, simulating uh, action sequences, uh, events away from the present, uh, and in particular, uh, communicating being a, a vital function of what uh, consciousness is for. Uh, and uh, the why we have it is to uh, relate to the social environment and culture, uh, which has uh, been our biological strategy, uh, the key to our success as human beings, and the essence of what makes us human. Thank you.